We will be talking about marriage. <laughs> we'll be talking about our Christian conduct in marriage. Before we open the book or our Bible, I'd like to get our uh, ushers to please pass the Bible around. And if you need the Bible, please raise your hand. So, and like the pastor said, uh, we teach the Bible here, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And uh, we'd like for you to be able to follow along that we, whatever we teach here, comes from the Word of God. And as we have mentioned today, We'll be talking about Christian conduct, specifically Christian conduct in marriage. Christian conduct at home. And also, not only Christian conduct at home, it's pretty much overall our Christian conduct on the outside. For the non-believers for us to see that we are supposed to be a good testimony for Jesus Christ our Lord. Let me give you a little background before we open our book. And please allow me to pray as you open our Bible in First Peter chapter 3. I have a lot of notes if you can see and I'm also nervous. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we would, like, we would like to thank you, Lord, for giving us this opportunity again to be up here. Thank you for the opportunity that you have given me, Lord, to be up here and use, be used by you as your messenger. Lord God, we know you are the Holy Father that is worthy of our praise and adoration. And Father God, Today, before we open your book and study your words, we ask that you forgive us our sins. Forgive us, Lord, for all the things that we have committed that is not pleasing or likable to you, Lord, as we also forgive those who have trespassed against us. And our Father, if there's anything that is going or hindering us today, when we study your word, Lord God, take it away. If we have anything, especially critical spirits that are lurking around us, Lord God, take them away. Give us, Lord God, a fertile and a teachable heart. Father, teach us whatever you teach us today. We pray that we can practice it in our lives in our daily lives, not only at home, not only in church, but everywhere, Lord God. And our Father, we want to thank you again for being here in this place. We'd like to welcome your Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Please lead us in this Bible study. Allow your Holy Spirit, oh God, to move freely among us. And tonight, or this morning, Father, I ask, as your messenger, that you control me. Put a door on my mouth and touch my tongue. Only allow me to speak simple words that are simple enough for my brothers and sisters to understand. Because I know, Lord God, we know that you want us to understand your words. Give us simple words, Lord God. And again, we ask that you give us the understanding to learn from you. And we ask that you lead us. Lead us, Lord God. Take control of this topic. Lead us in this Bible study. In Jesus' name we pray. Hey, if you haven't opened your book yet or your Bible, 
Open your Bible in 1 Peter chapter 3. If I ask, uh, if I can ask uh, Brother Bobby to please post the. Let me give you a little background. As far as we have tackled this, if you look at your uh, misled or our announcement, uh, our title for this is Christian Conduct, specifically Christian Conduct at Home. And coming from the Philippines with my age, for some of you probably don't even know what good manners or right conduct is. We're talking about conduct here, Christian conduct. In the Philippines, going to high school, when I was going to high school, that tells you how old I am. We are even graded for our good manners and right conduct. I don't know how it is here in the States. When I went to school here in the States, we are never graded for our conduct. In here, us Christians, we are graded not only by the Lord, we are graded for our conduct by our fellow Christians and most of the time to the non-believers on the outside. They're looking at you, they're looking at me, they're looking at us. How our conduct as Christians, how we carry ourselves, how our demeanor, how we conduct ourselves on the outside. So it's just right as we have topics of Christian conduct at home and as we say Christian conduct in marriage. What we're going to learn today, of course we're going to talk about our Christian conduct and how we can be effective witnesses as husbands and wives in the house, in our home. We are going to tackle some issues in Peter's time, which is all applicable in our time right now. Some of these issues that we're going in some circumstances that we're going to tackle or study may be sensitive to some not too sensitive for others. It could be sensitive for women, it could be sensitive as well for men. At one time, the Bible teaches us these verses that Peter primarily focused is on the marriage, as you can see. And to give you a background of when Peter wrote this, the first Peter book, Peter wrote this during the time of the Roman Empire, during the time of the scattered believers. Again, these are Christians. These are believers that are being persecuted for their belief, for their faith in Jesus Christ. The, the believers are being scattered and being persecuted. And during the Roman Empire, Peter talked about married women here. Married believing, married believing women in Christ. Before they heard this scripture or the gospel of Peter, these women are already or have already been married. That's why. Peter is addressing the wives here, the believing wives. In Peter's time also, it still exists for some of us who have a chance to go overseas on or in the Middle East. Some women are still, just like in Peter's time, they're still being treated like second class citizens. During the Roman Empire, the women are treated like property. They're like property. They're not treated like they are treated here in America. You treat a woman in America like your property, you're in trouble. During Peter's time, it's not the case. In Peter's time, the situation that Peter is describing here is for both husband and wives. 
that they have heard the gospel. Again, these are believing wives. The wife came to Christ, but the husband did not. Whether the husband had attended Bible study, or had been to services in the church, or had been fellowshipping with some believers, the husband persistently rejected the gospel. So the gospel that was presented here by Peter, they laid no man, the husband, as being disobedient. Men were labeled as being disobedient, disobedient in the sense that they were non-persuadable. The men were unwilling to listen to reasons concerning this gospel message. This does not only apply to unbelieving men and women, it also applies to us in our day. Are you with me so far? Okay, let me give you a little observation while I'm studying this. I was looking at the text. I noticed here, this is how we study the Bible. It's part of my observation here. I noticed that the first six verses deals with the wives. And then there's only one verse that we saw as dealing with the women, I mean with the men. Six verses for the wives. Our text centers of course on the relationships of husbands and wives which is the key relationships at home. Not only at home, it's also a key relationship here in the church. And reading the text, more attention is given to the Christian woman. I wonder why. Some women are going to be quiet here. Again, some of this are going to be sensitive. Some of this you don't want to hear. But this is what the Lord wants us to hear. This is the Word of God. More attention is given to the women who are married to unbelieving husbands. The reason is, in Peter's time, more, there are more women who came to Christ that were married to unbelieving husbands. That is the reason why Peter addressed more women in these verses. It's not what sometimes we think about, oh, women are bad, no. Since there were more women in Peter's time that came to Christ that are married to unbelieving husband, that is the reason why Peter gave six verses to the married women. Are you with me so far? Okay. And I want to clarify here. Again, Peter is addressing married women. These are the women that came to Christ after they were already married. We understand this so far. So then, let's start in verse 1. I'm going to read verse 1. It says, Wives, likewise, follow along with me here. It says, Wives, likewise, Be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives. If you look at verse 1 here, Peter encourages the Christian wife to be submissive. Submissive to who? Her own husband. Not to every man only to her own husband. Very unbright, simple, easy enough to follow. Wives, 
Be submissive only to your own husbands, not to every man. That Peter is that in their good conduct, they can actually win the hearts of their unbelieving husband to Christ by the believing woman submissive behavior they can actually persuade the unbelieving husband to come to Christ that's what Peter is telling us to win an un un unbelieving spouse without a word means that a wife should live in such a way that her conduct, we call it in the Philippines, good manners and right conduct, that her conduct cannot be called to question. Whatever the wife does in front of his man, I mean her man or her husband, the husband should have no reason to question what the wife is doing. But what Peter's telling us here, let me take my sticky. Well, Peter, I don't like to be unmovable. I like to move around. But what Peter's telling us here, when the wife became a believer, she came back home. She became a believer. She was so excited and happy. I'm a believer now. I know I'm saved. She was so excited. What did she do? She started sharing the word of God to the unbelieving husband. What else did she do? She has been telling her husband that it's time for you, my husband, to repent. It's time for you, my husband, to believe in Christ. She has been telling the husband. Also, she started nitpicking the things that the husband didn't do. She started making that husband of hers. She started making that husband of hers convicting him of his sins. Constantly, constantly, she's telling her husband, you need to come to Christ now. You need to go to church with me now. You need to change. You need to repent. So what happened? What happened? When the wife, I'm going to ask the men here, do we have men here? Yes, we do. Do we have men here? Okay, let me ask you, what happens if your wife comes home and telling you things over and over again? What do we call that? Nagging. Do we have wives here that nag? Do we have women here the next? Man, do we have women here the next? Amen. Are you afraid of your wives? Amen. You're so quiet, I don't know why. But I'm not speaking from, from experience. <laughs> My wife never nags me. So what happens when the woman nags on the wife? What? is the first reaction of the husband. I'm going to ask some husbands. What do you guys do when a woman or your wife starts nagging? What do you do? I want out! <laughs> I learned how to fish. <laughs> some of you probably went fishing or golfing. Maybe playing basketball or ride the bikes. I learned how to fish. I'm not saying that my wife nags. But the scripture tells us when the women, as we have learned our life lessons, women tend, they have that tendency to nag. Scripture, let's open it in Proverbs 21 9, Brother Bobby. What does it say? Proverbs 21 9. It says, Better to dwell in a corner of a house top than in a house shared 
with a contentious woman. It's almost like a nagging woman. Do you agree? What about Proverbs 29, I mean 21, 19? It also says, better to dwell in the wilderness. <laughs> better to dwell in the wilderness. Better to be away sometimes. Done with a contentious and angry woman. Amen. Amen. Wow. <laughs> I still have one more. I still have one more about nagging topic. It's in Proverbs 27. 15, 16. A continual dripping on a very rainy day and a contentious woman are alike. Whoever restrains her restrains the wind and the grass spoil with this right hand. Can we restrain the wind? Do we like the wife to constantly man? Of course not. Of course not. That's why we learn how to go fishing. Or <laughs> golfing. Even Brother Pete goes fishing. Brother Pete's here. Wow. What else? What else? I got a lot of notes here. Peter gives us the solution here in verse 2. In verse 2, in the second verse, I'm going to read it. When they observe your chase conduct accompanied by fear, I'm saying this is a solution for telling the wives not to be pushy. Not to be forceful. When you become a believer, don't force it to your husband that he better believe now. No. Even Jesus did not start kicking doors. He didn't force himself for us to believe him. Wives, don't force your husband to come to church. Don't force them. They take it as a nagging. This is, I'm not believing, I'm just telling the wives some solution now. Don't force it. Don't force it to your husband. Don't tell them, don't nag them. Don't be pushy and forceful. Show your husbands the benefits of turning to Christ. By being an example, show your husband that since you have became to be a believer in Christ, you have changed. That change that your husband sees in you will persuade him to become a believer as well. Don't force it. Be the example. Be the example for your husband. Are we catching this, wives? <laughs> Not only that, be the example that you have changed and of course pray for your husband to be a believer. And show your husband that you're not only showing him that you have changed, you need to think about his desires first. You need to sacrifice what you want. You need to see what he wants first. Now, if you started serving your husband and tell and telling your husband, honey, what do you need? What do you want? Your husband will be surprised. He couldn't take it. What happened to my wife? All of a sudden, her nature changed. By doing that, you will confuse your husband. He wouldn't know what to do. All of a sudden, you're treating him so nice. You're not nagging anymore. You're treating him so nice that he wanted to be a Christian. He could be persuaded that way. <laughs> We're only in verse 2. I'm going to... Do a little time check. It's only 11. Okay, we have some time. In the third verse, verse 3, do not let 
natural adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. <laughs> wow, you all can relate to this. I got plenty of notes, like I said. Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, putting on fine apparel. Wow. I'm going to tell you this. I'm looking at some women here in the front. I can see everybody here. It's so, so good to be up here. I'm not saying that you don't need makeup, but when you put on makeup, don't overdo it. Don't overdo it. That's what Peter's telling you. Don't overdo it. Nothing wrong with putting on makeup. Nothing wrong with wearing bling bling. Nothing, wear, nothing wrong with wearing all your necklaces as long as you can still stand up straight. Not like this. <laughs> Not like this. Okay? Nothing wrong with applying makeup or wearing bling bling. Just don't overdo it. That's what Peter is telling us. Beauty in the eyes of God is not the beauty that the society sees. The society only sees the outward beauty, but God can see the inward beauty in us. For you women. A woman's finest adornment is the cultivation of her inner character. That's your finest adornment. Cultivate that inner character. Cultivate that heart that you have. I'm going to go to verse 4 now before I go somewhere else. Verse 4, it says, I'm going to read also. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. Verse 4, I got three notes here. That's so many. <laughs> True beauty is the beauty of the heart. Let me do a little survey. Some of you are getting sleepy here. Let's do a little survey. How much time do you spend in front of the mirror? How much time do you spend in front of the mirror? Women? You spend plenty of time. This is not speaking from experience. Some of us are blessed with the bathroom. What do you call them? Romeo and Juliet, one sink for the husband, one sink for the wife. Not speaking from the husband. Husband perspective here. We have a big mirror. Some of you have this. How much beauty chemicals are there in front of the mirror? You have a Juliet, you have Romeo here. The wife's probably three quarters. The husband's only got this piece. How much time do you spend in front of that mirror? I'm lucky if I have my shaving cream, I don't shave. <laughs> I'm lucky if I have my shaver, a toothbrush in front of that mirror. I'm sorry, wife. My wife's beauty treatment is all over, all over my space. <laughs> How much time or money you spend on beauty products? I know you don't need it, but I'll tell you this, guys. Women are different from men. Amen. <laughs> Nothing wrong, just different. I didn't say they're wrong. I said different. Okay? I'm going to ask some more women here. How much beauty products do you find in men's bathroom? None. Only in husband's and wife's bathroom. So, pretty much the bathroom belongs to the women. Okay? There's so much beauty product. Beauty products. Products. My son called me on that. Products. 
brother. There's so much beauty, brother, in front of the mirror. But the women, how much time do we spend in the gym to get that? I'm not going to show you the figure that we're talking about. How much time does women spend at the gym to get that supposedly godly figure, goddess figure? How much time? How much time do women sacrifice doing unhealthy habits, not eating? How much time? Not us. <laughs> Men don't worry about that. Nothing wrong, just different. We don't worry about how we look. For some of us, there's some ex exceptions to the rule. There's some exceptions to the rule. I'm just doing this in a general case. How much time do we spend trying to look good, not only for your man, but for everybody? You can't even get out of your house without putting on any makeup. Some do, some spend a little, some spend a lot. We worry too much about what people will say to us or think about how we look. Man, are you taking notes? How much time do we really spend trying to look good for our man? The man that we don't have yet, or the man trying to keep the man that we already have. If that man is only after your love, I'm telling you this, he's not the right man. What if you lose your figure? They don't like you anymore. They're going to start looking for a younger one. I keep your brother under laughing there. What if you lose that? Again, what's important? the beauty of the heart. I'm going to encourage all women here. Women, if you live your life to please God with your spiritual beauty, the right guy will come and take notice of how good you really are. Okay. Try to please God first. Take care of the heart. The right person will come along in God's time. Okay, where are we now? Just verse, verse 5. Wow. Again, I'm looking at the time. I hope you're enjoying this. For in this manner, for in this manner, In former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. And I'm going to go up to verse 6. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do, not, if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. Good thing. I remember when I see Brother Martin here. All my notes are written in small letters. When you pray, put this in your pocket and it falls and you get caught. When taking the test, this is answered prayer. Holy God, you've been praying. Brother Martin knows that. So, in, in verse 5 and 6, Peter continued. Continue this advice to wives about being submissive. Peter continues telling the wife to be submissive again by referring to Sarah as an example. Peter went up to Genesis story of Sarah 
When the Bible teaches about marital submission, it does not suggest that somehow the wife is less than her husband. Since Sarah started calling Abraham Lord, that doesn't necessarily mean that women are lesser than a husband. They just have to be submissive. It doesn't belittle the women. It doesn't make you little in the eyes of God. They just, just like the Lord says, you just have to be submissive. When a woman is being submissive to a husband, we have learned that a woman is not regarded as less. It doesn't mean the woman doesn't make decisions anymore. They still make decisions. Amen. But at home or in church, the man is in charge, just like Christ is in charge of the, of the church. When, the, when a woman is being submissive to her husband, she's being submissive to the Lord Jesus Christ first and then to her husband. Amen. Although we have learned that women have to be submissive, however, God has established that husband should be the spiritual leader in the home and that both husband and wife should submit both Christ. Amen. It doesn't mean only the women is submitting. It doesn't mean since she is the believing wife, she was the only one who's supposed to submit. We are, both of us, husband and wife, are supposed to submit to Christ. We have dissected up to six verses. In, in, in verse 7, I'm going to read here. This is for the men now. The women have six verses. One verse for the men. We already know the reason why. In verse 7 it says, Husbands likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. Wow. <laughs> Although there's only one verse we think, it's only for men. I have a couple of notes here. Since husbands and wives are heirs together of the grace of life, they have equal worth before God. And when we started this, I'm, I've been studying this verse. I said, I thought it's only one, one verse for the man. But when we covered this, when Peter was preaching in this, in his time, remember, he wasn't only preaching to the men or the, or the women. He's preaching to both husbands and wives. So, to make this what Peter's talking about to husband only on this, he's speaking of the corporate prayers. He's talking to both corporately. He's talking to both husband and wife here. He's speaking of the prayer between husband and wife, which should be a regular in your household. How many husbands and wives here pray together at home? <laughs> Think with me. I'm going to take you back to what Peter is talking about. Think with me here. When there is constant bickering, when there is strife in your house, when your spouse, when you and your spouse are not getting along at home, how easy 
Is it to hold your spouse's hand and pray together? Is that easy or not? Not. When you're fighting or constantly arguing, is it easy to pray together in the home? I don't think so. When you're not honoring each other as joint heirs in Christ, how easy for you to pray together? It's not easy. Amen. Have we experienced that? Amen. Yes. It's not easy. When you're giving each other silent treatment, you're not talking to one another, how easy is it to pray? Again, husbands and wives, some of this like we have studied, some of this you don't want to hear, but this is what you need to hear. Amen. <laughs> Let me ask the men here. Do we still have men here? Do we still have men? Let me ask the men. Men, do we, are we still here? Okay. If your wife does not submit to you at home, <laughs> if your wife does not submit to you at home, and she does not want to obey in your God-given authority to be the spiritual leader in your home, how easy is it to hold her hand and pray together? Men, is it easy to hold your wife's hand if she doesn't respect you or submit to you? Come you on follow. now, shame the devil. <laughs> shame on them. I did, that was my word. It's not easy. It's not easy. If your wife, if my wife does not submit to me at home, it's, it's not easy for me to grab her hand and pray together. I'm going to ask the women since the men are so quiet. If your husband does not show you special treatment, honoring you, and guarding you and respecting you and loving you at home as he's supposed to do how easy is it for you to grab your husband's hand and pray together it's not easy not easy at all not easy at all it's not easy when you have some misunderstanding at home it's not easy to pray together Friends, if your spouse are not praying together, if you have tried praying together at home before and have no, no much, don't have much luck, it's kind of hard. You won't have a little, a little, but maybe little to nothing at all. No success in praying together when you are bickering, fighting, constantly arguing. It's so hard to pray together. Amen. I'm not speaking from experience. <laughs> now, we can allow, we can allow our sin, our stubbornness and our pride to build a wall between us between a husband and wife. If we want to stay stubborn and prideful and keep that wall and don't pray, is that what we want? No. We're supposed to be husband and wife. We're supposed to be together. But we can turn that wall into a bridge so we can both pray together. Amen. Make that wall turn it into a bridge as husbands and wives, that you can pray together. <laughs> Pastor, Pastor Johnny is here. I know we're talking about husbands and wife here. I'd like to congratulate Pastor Johnny here. It's their 40th wedding anniversary.
Pastor John is birthday. He turns 70 today. The reason I said that, I'm only on verse 7. We have a little bit, a little bit more time. We're only on verse 7. The reason I said that, because I was always amused and encouraged by people holding hands when they walk along. Just like when we're praying, we hold hands. Husbands and wives. I'll tell you a story. Uh oh, are you ready for the story? Amen. When I was young, up to now, when I see old people holding hands in the mall, I admire them. I admire them. Not only that I admire them, I give up the most to that man. He's so romantic. Holding hands. <laughs> I'll tell you another story. I have my own story. <laughs> when we go to the mall, I hold my wife's hand as well. <laughs> I'm so proud. You think I'm romantic? Yeah. No, I'm not. I'm not romantic. I'm not romantic by holding her hand. When I'm holding her hand, I'm praying. And she won't buy it. I'm hoping she doesn't grab anything in the mall. telling you that's my secret do you have secrets too verse 7 teaches us that nothing extinguishes the flame of prayer like marital friction so don't fight too much get along no matter how you pray if you're keeping that bitterness in your heart we all know God's not going to listen. We have that wall. Make that wall into a bridge. Are you with me so far? Let's try to finish this in verse 8. Wow. Verse 8. I'm going to try and go 8 and 9. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love us, brothers. Be tenderhearted. Be courteous. Not returning evil for evil or reviling. For reviling, but on the contrary, blessing. Knowing that you are called to this, that you may inherit blessing. Wow. I look at verse 8 and 9 here. Peter gives us series of conduct. Our topic. How to behave as husbands and wives. How to treat one another, not only husbands and wives. How to treat our fellow Christians. How to treat everybody. If we do these things that Peter is telling us, to be compassionate, to be compassionate to one another, loving them as brothers and sisters. My observation here, we are in this classroom. I look at that golden rule. Look at that blackboard. If you do that, the golden rule, treat others as you would like to be treated. That's what Peter is telling us. That's what Peter is telling us. We will inherit a blessing. Instead of reviling, we should be encouraging. If, if our neighbor is a non-believer, they're constantly looking at your character. They're looking how you conduct yourself on the outside, not only at home, also on the outside. Now, when your neighbor don't hear you, you're so quiet, even with the windows open, they don't hear you. Wow, is that a positive thing? It is a positive thing. They don't hear you quarreling. Yelling at, it, at one another, especially here in Vegas, our house is only like four feet or eight feet away from each other. And you open the windows when it's hot or cold, you hear the dogs. When your neighbor sees or doesn't hear you, they think you're a very happy couple. Especially if you're a Christian. Now, 
that's your opportunity. When your neighbor started trying to find out why you don't work, use that opportunity. They're being anxious now. They want to know why you are so quiet, why you are such a good Christian. They want to be a good Christian as well. Take that opportunity to share the gospel with them. That's what Peter's telling us here. T Peter's telling us here, no bickering, I mean, no, don't revile, no reviling to one another. It's so easy <laughs> to understand when you get mad. Especially coming up here, if you're driving and you're already late and somebody got in front of you, what do you do? If you're in a hurry coming to church, and a kid step out of the street and say, what do you do? You hit your brakes? You don't say nothing? Somebody cut you off in a, in a freeway? You don't say nothing? If you do that, you're a good Christian. You hold your mouth. You held your mouth. You didn't say nothing. Is that hard to do or what? It's hard to do. But it, is it possible? Yes. yes, it is. Before you open your mouth, Think of the Lord. Think. Think. Peter tells us here things that are easy to understand but hard to do. Think. The word think. Before you open your mouth, before you say something, think. P -H -I -N -K. Did I spell it right? Think. Think about is it true? The letter P, is it true before you say anything? Is it true? The letter H. If I spell it, is it helpful? <clears throat> the letter I, is it inspiring? Think. Before you say anything, is it necessary? Before you say anything, before you open your mouth, the letter K, is it kind? How do you handle yourself? How do you conduct yourself as a Christian? Are we just like the non-believers? Or we think before we open our mouth? Let's finish it up. Verse 9 and 10. I mean, we, 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 we went up to verse 9. Let's, let's go to verse 10 here. So finish it up. I'm looking at the time there. For he who would love life and see good, good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Basically, what Peter did here, he just quoted Psalm 32. He quoted Psalm 32, 12, uh, verse 12 to 16. That's pretty much it. But this is what Peter did. He just quoted Psalm 32, verse 12 to 16. Let me summarize. I know we're almost out of time here. Let me summarize what we have learned. Did you learn something today? Yeah. Let me summarize what, what we have learned from 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1 to 12. We'd like to welcome our folks. Please sit down if you want. Okay. Let me just summarize what we have learned today. We have learned about Christian conduct. Husbands and wife. Christian conduct at home. Christian conduct. G GMRC, good manners and right conduct. We have learned Christian conduct in marriage. We have learned that in marriage, Christian conduct takes some work. You believe it? Takes some work. You have to work together, husbands and wife. If you like a nice lawn or a, a nice yard, what do you do? You have to work it out. You can't just have a, a nice yard unless you have plenty of money. And then it doesn't feel good because you didn't do it. Marriage is something like that. You have to work it out. There's nothing wrong between husbands and wives. There's nothing wrong with women wearing makeup. There's nothing wrong with husbands that don't like nagging. 
one of the weakness that I see, a life lesson for men, they have the tendency to neglect their wife. Yeah. <laughs> I heard some from women. If the women have the tendency to nag their husband, the husband have the tendency to neglect their wife. Am I a good example? <laughs> Let me give you an, an example here. In Proverbs, Brother Bobby, Proverbs chapter 15, verse 17. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a padded cap with hatred. If you as a husband spend all your time at work, you don't hardly go home. You want to make more money. More money is good, but you got to have some time for your wife. Some of us here are alcoholic. Let me share you another story. I know it's almost time, but, but I'm enjoying it here. I'm sorry. Let me share you something. I know some of you already know I used to serve in the military. I'm going to share this with you. I made my kids cry when I was watching them. We have a brother here still active duty. When I did my retirement speech in front of 700 strong, this is what I told my kids. I told my kids because I was always gone, most of the time. Eight, nine months, eight, nine months, I'm always gone. That's why none of my children wants to join the service anymore, because I was always gone. So when I told them, in my speech, I said, my children, I'm going to be home every day now. And I told them, I'm going to be home every day, but now you don't even want to stay home with me. <laughs> That's kind of hard. I've been working hard, being away, trying to make that dinner. But without love, it's nothing. I'm telling you. I'm speaking from experience. It's a good thing now which is here. And there's another verse here. Verse 27. Brother Bobby. Verse 27, Proverbs, and verse 8. I mean, chapter 27, verse 8. Like a bird that wanders from its nest. Nest. It's a man who wanders from his place. I told you, I've been gone a lot of times. This not only for the men, this is for the women as well. Yes. Some of you I know, you spend long hours of work yes. to make good money, <laughs> to make good life for your family. Please don't be like me. Don't wander around too much. Don't wander around too much. Spend some time with your family. Amen. Spend some time with your wife. Amen. Spend some time with your spouse. Amen. Spend some time with your children. Yes. Although your wives might be nagging, they're different. Amen. They're different. Nothing wrong. Just different. Another difference. Before you go fall asleep on me. Another difference. We have Brother Johnny here, Pastor Johnny and Sister Rose. When women goes to wedding, brother Jody, Mr. Michelle, when we go to a wedding, let me tell you some difference between husbands and wife. What's the difference between the wedding dress for the wife? Wedding dress for the wife had to be brand new. Is it true or false? Women, they gotta have some brand new things. What about the men? If it's me, I take my slacks. That's hanging, I smell it, that's good enough. <laughs> it makes no difference for men. The women, men thinks logically. Women thinks sentimentally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or, wow, are we enjoying this? Yeah. When you try to work as much, more is not bad. I 
like I said, that we, we have learned more is not bad, but more without love is bad. We can give you some solutions in the scripture here. Scripture tells us, give us solutions in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 to 25. Men, what? Love your husband. Women, respect. I mean, men love your wife, I'm sorry. <laughs> men love your wife. Women, respect your husband. Both of you have to be submissive. Of Christ first. Women, they are the weaker vessel. In general, physically, women are weaker, but there are some exceptions. Some women are small, more stronger than men, more I, uh, more stronger, faster. Generally speaking, they are the weaker vessel. So, in order for us. I think we can solve some of the problems in our marriage. We can solve some of the problems in our marriage. Let's reverse nagging into kindness. <laughs> Thank you. Let's reverse. Let us reverse neglecting into loving. We give you some more solutions in the scripture. And I, I'm almost done. But I'm so I'm enjoying this so much. In the scripture, it says in Proverbs 15, verse 23, brother buddy. In Proverbs 15, verse 23, it says, A man has joy by the answer of his mouth, and the word spoken in due season, how good it is. Replace those nagging words into good words. Praise words. And also in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 24. These are the solution. From nagging into kind words, from neglecting into loving. Pleasant words are like a honeycomb. Sweetness to the soul and health to the bones. Yes. Are those good solutions? Yes. Can we do those? Can we apply those in our marriage? Yes. Wow. I keep saying this is the last. I got one more application. <laughs> Are you ready to eat? No. Okay. One last application. Some of you came here from far, far away. Just like all of us here. Most of us came from the Philippines. Most of us from different states. Most of us, we have ridden airplanes. Have you ridden airplanes? Have you been on an airplane before? I think all of us who have not been on an airplane, we have not been in an air airplane yet. I don't see no hands. This is a good application. To be a good example, when the stewardess comes out in front of the aisle, what do they do? In case of an emergency, what? The oxygen. Exit, the oxygen comes down. The oxygen comes down. What do they tell you? Put your good oxygen on first before you help the little kid or anybody else. Let's put that as an application. Before we expect your husband or wife to change, husbands and wife, be a good example. Put the good oxygen first before you try to tell them. Here's your oxygen. Don't force it. Are you catching that? Amen. Be the good example before. You ask somebody else to change. You can't change anybody. Only God can change that person. Be the good example. As Peter is telling us, be the good example. So whatever we do, we can glorify the Lord. Did we learn something today? Let's get up. Please stand up.